So it's 11 o'clock. Uh, welcome to our seventh webinar, international webinar on uh, food digestion. My name is Andre Brodkov and I'm based at the Chagas Food Research Center here in Famoy in Ireland. It is St. Patrick's week. However, Ireland is still in a lockdown situation, so celebrations will be uh, at home and a bit more subdu subdued, uh, uh, more than usual, let's say that. So today, um, today's webinar is organized by Working Group 5 of the InfoGest uh, network. And without any further delay, I hand over to uh, uh, Carolina Orfela, who is one of the Working Group leaders. Thank you very much, André. And I would like to extend uh, my welcome to all of you for joining this special seminar on starch. But before we start, a few words on Working Group 5. Uh, we're a group of around uh, 60 researchers from academia and industry interested in starch and its digestion. Uh, the working group co-leaders currently are Nadia Siegert, uh, Bing Zhang and myself. And we have a number of objectives which are mainly to provide a forum to discuss issues related to amylase, amylases and starch digestion, to harmonize a method to measure amylase activity or commercial enzymes, and to propose a robust and reproducible method for stimulating starch. Uh, we particularly welcome uh, researchers from um, early careers, as well as established researchers to join our working group. And if you're interested, you can send me an email with the subject line InfoGest Working 5. But to the topic of today's seminar, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Pro Pro Professor Serge Perez, uh, from CERMAV in Grenoble, where he's Emeritus uh, Research Director. He's also the founder of Glycopedia. Uh, his research into the three-dimensional structure of polysaccharides has been an inspiration for many of us working in carbohydrate research. His landmark research into the crystalline components of starch gave us the basis for understanding starch structure at the nano scale. Why is this interested to work in group five? Well, mainly because to understand digestion, we need to understand the substrate uh, and how the substrate interacts with the enzyme. So today, Serge will give a talk uh, out, um, entitled, sorry, um, an iconoclast view on amylopectin, which as the title suggests, uh, is likely to be very thought provoking. Uh, so over to you, uh, Serge Perez. Okay. So hello to all of you. It's a pleasure to be online with you. It would be difficult to say good morning because, you know, we all come from a different zone. So I wish you a very nice day all together. And I want to start by uh, thanking the organizer for this invitation. Uh, maybe it's a risky invitation because I'm going to be talking about um, several years of research, you know, that concentrated uh, about understanding from the physical aspect, the structure of starch. And uh, even though the catchy title was an iconoclast view on amylopectin, I have a subtitle, a subtitle to me is this uh, algorithmic beauty of starch. And I hope that you will appreciate this algorithmic beauty over this presentation. So now, whenever we talk about, um, about starch, I realized not long ago, I just wrote a small, a small preface for the book. And this preface was entitled Starch as a Marker and Determinant in the Evolution of Humankind. And what I was looking for is when the starch started to be domesticated all over the world. And if you see this slide, you know, there have been several places where about um, more than 10,000 years ago, around 10,000 years ago, starch was uh, domesticated, of course, around the Yangtze River, that was about rice, the fertile Christian region, about wheat, and then we have the potatoes and we have, and we have corn. In, uh, in America. And for us, starch is so important because you know, it's governed a little bit a strong part of our history. 
And today, we may have forgotten about this domestication, but uh, if you take a look at the different fields all around us, you will see these different plants that are essential for our humankind. Of course, you will recognize rice, corn, wheat, and potatoes. All different, though, come from different botanical origin. And yet, if you start extracting the starch grain from these, you will see some striking similarities. Similarities in shape. Of course, the dimension may be different, but the shape are always reminiscent, there are details and so forth. So we ask ourselves the question, what's so common to all these uh, different uh, starts from different origin? Then if instead of having this picture, you take another picture and you take this one, this one is looking at this granule under a polarized light and we all see right away the appearance of the so-called Maltese cross, which indicate that there are some structuration which occur in all these starch granules, irrespective of their origin. And of course, my, my interest and the interest of some of us is to understand how this is coming together. In order to do that, of course, we have also to ask a question. We are using starch because this is a tremendous reserve for us. And for this reserve to be useful, starch has to be packed with some sort of high density. And the density of starch, which has been evaluated, is about 1.5. So this, this is going to be a, a constant question. Can we organize, can we understand at the molecular and macromolecular level, the organization of the simple molecules that are making starch to arrive at some sort of a capacity of a density which is in this value of 1.5. Whenever we talk about, of course, the crystallinity, there have been some debate in the community. People can calculate, can measure the crystallinity using diffraction method. People can measure some sort of different type of crystallinity, but three-dimensional arrangement uh, using NMR spectroscopy. And of course, we do not see the same thing because we don't measure uh, exactly the same thing, but we all arrive at the conclusion that the density is quite high in this, uh, all these starches. This is a, uh, the book that is going to be published not too long ago, in a, in a, in a few months, which is uh, Enzymology of Complex Alpha Glucan. And the author of the books, the cover, they put together Two major, two major components, which are altogether made of glucose, linked alpha-1,4 or linked alpha-1,6. And these two components are starch on the one hand here and glycogen on the other one. Both of them are made of the same molecules, but the way this constituting alpha-1,6 linkage are different in the two components and this explains also the fact that in particular case of glycogen, the reserve which is available in glycogen is, is readily available. We are, we are in starch. This is a reserve for, for, for plants and so forth. So it cannot be readily available and the capacity and the organization may be different. I have here this video. I hope it will work. Let me see if it works. Yes, I have here the video that has been uh, made together some time ago that was explained to use a different Look, level of organization. A year of corn picked out of millions produced each year in the world. Standing on its stem, burnt by the sun, it's still wrapped in its protective husk. These grains are actually fruits. Each one of them contains a germ which will enable the birth of a new plant. Let's get closer. Inside, the germ is unfortunately invisible because it's hidden under an enormous flowery layer. This layer is called the starch, the germ's nutritive reserve. 
As we move a bit closer, the starch reveals its structure, a multitude of small grains organized in layers like those of an onion. There are billions of starch grains in any one kernel. This stock of complex sugars constitutes an indispensable reserve of energy for the hidden corn seed. It will enable it to grow during the next season when planted in the ground. The white scraps that you can see now are fragments of cell walls in which the starch grains are held. We can also see even smaller grains agglutinated around the starch grains. These granule cells are proteins in reserve, also useful to the seed. A slightly damaged grain enables us to catch a glimpse of its inner structure. Through the breach at the top of the screen, we can see again a structure in layers a series of steps of starch molecules. A starch molecule in a starch grain, itself held inside a corn kernel. What an amazing recurrence, like nature playing at Russian dolls. As we move even closer, we discover arrangements alternating light and dark patches. It's the molecular structure of the sugar grains that starch is made of. Impossible to go any further. Our microscope has reached its limits. Beyond this, nothing is visible for the moment. Okay, so nothing is visible for the moment. So the name of the game was to understand whether we could go from this simple glucose residue, which is making up the starch granule, and to understand more about the complexity of the arrangement within this granule here. And this has to go about four orders of magnitude. So you will see this arrow all along my talk with the progression that we have got through different type of understanding, different type of modeling, and every time I will show this arrow, you will see also that what is proposed is compatible in terms of structure of starch component, but also interaction in terms of energy and so forth. So first of all, the, the key, one of the key findings was of whenever it was possible to uh, record, as that was a work by Professor Sarko to record fiber diffraction of the two types of starch, type A from cereals, type B from tubers. And these are the experimental data that we wanted to work on. You know, in contrast to what you are used to know with, uh, in the field of protein, these are indeed very limited set of data. But we could see the differences. And of course, also of importance was to compare this uh, organization here with the one which could be obtained by using electron diffraction on single crystal of starch. Here, this is a B-type starch, and this is A-type starch, and D-type starch here. That was done by Henri Chanzi and collaborator in, in Grenoble. So trying to understand this fiber diffraction diagram was not easy, but of course we could rely on molecular modeling techniques whereby by constructing in a computer the low energy conformation of this maltose residue, which is a basic residue of starch, one could calculate what are the, reg the region of space which are available for low energy conformation and at the same time, what one would be able to construct what would be the perfect helical structure corresponding to this organization of this so-called glycosidic angle. So this is the result here. That's a map that we can draw. And this map shows something of interest. It shows that in the low energy region of the map here, 
there is a possibility to construct helical structure that would repeat under translation of about 2.1 nanometers. But actually what we could see on the fiber diffraction diagram was that the repeat, you know, the experimentally observed repeat was about only 1.05 nanometer. So the only way to reconcile the experimentally observed information with the computational calculated uh, results was to invoke the formation of the double helical structure, which is shown here. So this double helical structure, you will see that one helical structure here, there another one, both are left-handed helices and they complement each other very well. And so actually you understand why the X-ray was only seeing one half of that, because this is what you see and repeats. So that was the basic idea, the basic foundation for proposing the ball helical structure, to which then it was extended to a solve or propose a survey uh, to solve the crystal structure at the two uh, form, A and B type. And that was a work done in collaboration with Anne Imberti and colleagues from INRA Nantes. And these are the famous, now yeah, you show this one in mini textbook. This is a, present, or a projection of the double structure in a type starch, correlation to this one. And this is the way the double structure is also found in B star, with also a central cavity, which is capable of uh, having hydration up to 36 water molecule in this particular case. Then you ask your, yourself the question, but also that was done quite a long time ago, and it was just a proposal from this combination of modeling and a few experimental data. But later on, colleagues in Grenoble were capable of growing in, 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 in the lab, single crystal of ATAC starch, which are shown here, beautiful single crystals. And these single crystals, whenever uh, investigated using synchrotron radiation facility, could give, could, uh, could, could help solving a crystal structure. And very much to our pleasure, one could see that the double helical structure that was solved by this electron diffraction, is an X-ray diffraction study, was very close to the one which was proposed 10 years before. The only difference being the, uh, an extra water molecule which was there. So this means something of interest that the double helical formation does not require enzyme. It may eventually be speed up by the role of enzyme, but this can be done without the enzymic action. And then one also can see that uh, the difference, there is a difference in morphology, which of course depends upon the growing condition. We don't claim these are corresponding to the morphology which is found in starch. So what do we have? We have this experimental vision here, and to this experimental vision, we can add this double equal structure. But we still have a long, long way to go and to understand how this double equal structure can be arranged. So to, again, a theoretical investigation starting from double equal structure could show that there were only two ways of packing in a very condensed form, a double helical structure. And these two ways are shown here and they correspond exactly to the ways that A and B type starch occur, which means in a sense that there is no possibility to have a polymorph, a pure polymorph, that would be C starch. And actually this, of course, establishes the fact that the C type starch may be a, a blend, may be made of the crystals having the B type and crystal having the A type starch. Whenever we talk about starch, of course, and amylopectin, we have to consider the role of the alpha-1,6 linkages. When you talk about the polymer, in polymer, usually this alpha-1,6 linkages are making very flexibility. Is that the same here? If you construct from the double helical structure, you realize that you can link two strands here by this alpha-1,6 linkage. So this is one type of 1,6 linkage. And there is another type of 1,6 linkage also, which occur 
whenever you want to link this object here uh, with, the, uh, with another chain, which could be a chain of aminos. And this, of course, is not creating any conflict. And this is a small video that showed that uh, there are complementarity of things. And actually, one six linkages are not destroying any sort of crystalline arrangement. And that was shown also by a, by a very thorough investigation that was uh, conducted also with, uh, uh, with our colleague from, inland, from, from Ireland that showed that many types of conformation could be established, being stable, throughout also the formation of 116 cages. So that was another fact that uh, could be proven. And then came this observation that uh, under particular experimental condition, some nanocrystals having the form of plate plate could be obtained. That was from waxy maize. And these shapes could be observed here in electron, in electron microscopy. And very much to our surprise, the shape of these observed crystals were reminiscent of the shape of the, crystal, of the, of the crystalline unit cell, which could be constructed and to explain the formation of the, of the arrangement in A, B starch. And the work done in collaboration with Eric Bertort showed that on this particular uh, nanocrystals, the way that the, uh, the one six linkage, the way that the alpha one four linkage was identical to the usual way that has been reported whenever people do this sort of characterization, not on single crystal, but on large quantity. So in a sense, these single crystals here are extremely good models to continue the investigation. And this investigation could be also continued Again, using what has been established previously, that is a formation of the double helical structure, formation of a, some sort of the one six linkages here, which may not be linked into trapped into the crystalline arrangement. And that shows here some example. And from that, we could construct uh, what uh, also three dimensional models of these single crystals and of nanoplated crystals that are shown here. And we arrive at the conclusion that uh, these single crystals could be calculated, could be constructed. They have uh, two different uh, properties. We can uh, construct uh, either uh, there is a chirality in this, in this uh, crystal. They can be left-handed or right-handed. And there is a polarity that is, in a sense, this side of the crystal is different from the other one. And these models here, it's also a model which is stable in terms of uh, conformation, shows what has been shown in a very repeated fashion, and that is this repeat distance of about nine nanometers, which in a sense corresponds to the crystalline region, which can be here, about 6.57 uh, Armstrong, and then the so-called amorphous part, which is sitting on top of the crystalline arrangement, which is about, about a 2 to 0.5 uh, Armstrong, and that uh, has this uh, less, less order chain, which has these one six link linkages plus alpha one four linkages. So we could have also a theoretical model consistent with the observed exp experimental ex observation that uh, was also that could be placed on this scale. And so we were in the 10 to the minus meter range, and this was a single crystal explaining the observation of these nano crystals here. And then came, of course, so, so the contribution, the unique contribution that the synchrotron radiation facilities can uh, provide in this, uh, in this area. And the, the, the significant work contribution was done here in Grenoble as a synchrotron radiation facility where colleagues from Indra Nantes and uh, CERMAV uh, uh, worked together to establish a cartography of the crystalline region of starch. So this is a starch granule that has been submitted to uh, X-ray diffraction, a very tiny beam of X-ray diffraction coming from the synchrotron. And these are examples. These are fiber diffraction diagrams 
recorded on this single uh, starch granule. Uh, knowing the crystal structure, one could assess what could assess the orientation of all this crystalline domain within this starch granule here. And the model showed that could be oriented nanocrystals oriented this way with respect to starch granule. The work went further, further refined. So there was a possibility now to describe on these things, to describe the location of uh, some sort of crystalline arrangement uh, composing the starch granule. And more work came whenever uh, also colleagues from, from, from SAMAB and from ESRF were able to collect all these fabulous, this is fantastic uh, fiber, dif uh, fiber diffraction diagram on this uh, starch granule, which is shown here. And from that, defining the relative orientation and the crystalline domain. So this is, this is a fantastic tour de force. And you should realize that you know, putting such a granule into the high energy uh, beam, uh, uh, X-ray beam, you know, was done in such a way that you know, there was not even uh, burning at that. So we, they did not make popcorn out of this experiment. Other work has been done also on a potato starch using synchrotron radiation facility. And then not only the, what we call the wide angle X-ray scattering was collected, but the small angle X-ray scattering was collected. And from this collection of the orientation of the crystalline domain, the author of the work arrived at the conclusion that uh, could exist a super helical model that was uh, constructing following uh, what is shown here on the right part of the slide, with again having this 0.9 nanometer repeat and having this sort of orientation. So this is one of the models which was proposed. And this model was also inspired in some way by the work which has been done before by our colleagues from Ooster Gettel and Van Bruggen by uh, doing electron uh, diffraction reconstruction, imaging and reconstruction of a star granule that arrive also they propose that a super helical structure would be uh, likely to occur. And that was explaining what they could see in the electron diffraction experiment, in the, in the experiment. So we came to this conclusion now that in this range of 10 to the minus 7 meter, there was the occurrence of the super helical structure, which of course could embed, could incorporate the crystalline lamella that has been proposed and constructed before. So that was a step forward. And then, then we continue, of course, by if you cannot go into the, the, the inside of the granule, you can also uh, use AFM technology to have imaging of what's the periphery of the granule. So there is uh, uh, some diagram, some images, uh, which were taken by, by colleagues uh, in Nantes and also by, uh, in other places that shows that there was an alternation of what's called blocklet structure, which had dimension varying depending upon whether there was a tuber starch or several starch. But this blocklet structure had the different diameters, which could be estimated of the size of being about 100 to 400 nanometers in one case, and then in, a, in the other case of about 25 to 100 nanometers. And the existence of this blocklet has been, of course, a puzzling question for our community for quite a long time. And that was confirmed also by, use, by the use of enzyme. And for example, if I take here the crystal structure of alpha amylase, which has been solved by conventional X-ray diffraction, and you will see that the crystal structure of X-ray amylase is totally, has no possibility to have a double helical structure, which is, in, which is in the combining site. So this means that for the alpha amylase to be degraded, degrading the star granule, it has to work on a single chain, which maybe you can call amylose chain, but it cannot work on double helical structure. And if you use the same sort of amylase to degrade also the star granule, 
one arrive at the conclusion that there is always a resistant moiety, which are indicating by the occurrence of constituting elements, which were called, which are called uh, blocklets. So there was a lot of uh, experimental information converging towards the uh, occurrence of uh, lamella, amylopectin lamella, which would be organized into something which was meant to be spherical blocklets with different uh, ranges, and this uh, size depending upon the start botanical origin and the location in the granule. And the fact was of this observation came from scanning electron microscopy, electron microscopy, uh, atomic force microscopy, but also enzymic hydrolysis, chemical labeling, and enzymic degradation, followed by chromatographic separation. So we continue our, our journey from this, uh, this arrow. And now we have this uh, puzzling point. Can we construct, can we have more ideas about the, this blocklet? And so, and that was a puzzling for us. But then we turn our attention, just looking around the nature, and we say, maybe we should have this hypothesis. So this hypothesis was that uh, we observe, and it's observed that nature retains hierarchical material structure at all levels, and that can be considered as the occurrence of what I'm calling a phyllotaxy-like feature. That, but this uh, phyllotaxy feature would take place not at the micro or range, but at uh, nano to micrometers. So the phyllotaxy, maybe some of you don't know the detail of that. Huh? So the phyllotaxy describes the arrangement of leaves on a stern or an axis. But it also is a study of, uh, of all this arrangement. So this is an observation, but this observation is not only uh, concerned with, uh, with uh, vegetal, with plant. It also uh, concerning with the occurrence of organized patterns, which are self-organizing within the context of dynamic system. And there is a, this fundamental paper that has been published by Turing, Alan Turing in 1952, a few, few, few years before he died that is entitled The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, and that was aiming to explain how chemical reaction could result in large-scale patterns. So for example, the pine cones, like in this case, but also hexagon in flies, eyes, and so forth. And according to this theory, this would be a chemical reaction, or close chemical reaction, that, we, that is called reaction diffusion, that, that follow a reaction um, diffusion equation. So for example, if you take the palm corn, I have indicated here the appearance of the, of, of the spiral, that you, what can identify a different spiral. And then we talk about uh, the spiral phyllotaxy, where each successive element is at an angle of about 135 degrees relative to the previous one. And this follow some sort of the, the golden ratio. And this is called in mathematics and elsewhere, the Fibonacci phyllotaxy. So we, we say we should try to construct uh, such a phyllotactic features, knowing what we know about starch. So what do we know? We know the occurrence of these uh, single crystals. We know the occurrence also of a less, uh, less order uh, portion of the single crystal. So that would be forming this 0.9 nanometer, 0.9 Armstrong, sorry. And then we have dimension of the, of the, of the shape of the single crystal. And we also know that we have the right-handed and left-handed uh, crystal, which can, which can occur. So in collaboration with, with, uh, with uh, someone, <laughs> with my friend uh, from, from Ancona, Francesco Spinozzi, we started to investigate this, uh, this, how this hypothesis could be put forward. 
So we, which required a lot of, uh, of mathematics. I will not go into the math of this, of this exercise, but uh, just to cut a long story short that we constructed what we call these golden spirals, which are made of parallelepipeds with a dimension compatible with what has been observed. And these parallelepipeds will be arranged in layers of n parallelepipeds stacked and rotated with respect to each other according to these Fibonacci golden angles. And we did this construction for several types of geometry, for several types of, um, of, of uh, number of spirals. And we call that, in this particular field, we call this golden spiral ellipsoid. And the right hand side of the slide, you, sh you can see what uh, would be this one of these gold spiral ellipsoid that can be constructed. So we're constructing many of these. And of course, we say, OK, but this one, one day, will be maybe under the possibility of being studied by either doing neutron scattering or, or electron scattering or X-ray scattering. So at the same time, for each of this construction, we're constructing and we display what would be the theoretical scattering pattern that all this arrangement would give. So I don't want to go into the details of that, but this is available and the methodology is available, which can be applied also to other type of construction if needed. So we were happy with this construction, but we say, okay, how can we make sure that as this has some sense with respect to what we know in, in, in the field of, uh, of starch. And we were some sort of puzzled for quite a long, some time. And then by uh, going into the literature and discussing with colleagues, we observe that uh, several types of experiments have been reported not too long before. And one of these experiments was uh, reported by uh, this colleague Teres Herrera during her PhD thesis, and by uh, using a six day of acid hydrolysis on maize, she could, and her collaborator, uh, could uh, obtain you know, this isolated macromolecule, which, which are shown here, which has a form, the shape of cigar, unlike the, like the shape of the ellipsoid, which we had constructed. At the same time, there was another type of report, which has been reported about 10 years ago, that showed the effect of iodine absorption on the crystallinity of developing wheat starch granule. And this result of the observation, that this is one, one picture, but several are, are available, I just selected one, was also showing this sort of a cigar type of, uh, of morphology, which was not explained at the time. So by combining the result of our uh, modeling with this observation, we arrived uh, that uh, it would be tempting to suggest that uh, the spiral that we have been, the ellipsoid that have been constructing following this very simple principle of uh, phyllotaxis construction using the basic geometry of the nanocrystal this shape would be very similar to the shape that has been observed during totally independent experimental data. And very much also to our satisfaction, whenever we, can, we calculate the molecular weight of uh, such a constructed ellipsoid, we arrive at the conclusion that we are reaching the 10 to the minus 9 Dalton. And these very high figures are figures which have been reported for amylopectin. So this is how we are tempting to suggest that uh, this uh, golden spiral ellipsoid represent what would be a crystal, the structure of amylopectin, amylopectin being considered as being an individual starch nanoparticle. So this is where we stand now, and this is what, I'm, uh, what I've been calling this uh, uh, unusual uh, iconoclast view on amylopectin. We have this, this vision, which corresponded to which integrate all of the information 
geometric information which have been collected before, and that has been extended using this, uh, this principle of phylotaxy. And of course, what's important also is that uh, so this model of blocklet here would be the individual amylopectin particle. So again, you see the, uh, this is an hypothesis, but we, we draw this conclusion. And it remains, of course, important to see how this is compatible with the biosynthetic steps of the starch biosynthesis, which, of course, is another story. But what is important as well is that if we consider this blocklet model, then we can integrate in this blocklet model the so-called building block backbone model that Eric and uh, Ian have been I mean, describing in these things. And the beauty about uh, this building black block model, which is different from the Izukuri model, which has never been capable of uh, constructing anything in terms of three dimension, this uh, building block backbone integrates most of the information which have been derived from the details and minute uh, deg degradation and, uh, and anatomy description and what occurs in starch. So we think that uh, both of these building block backbone model can be integrated into this, uh, the, the model, the phylotactic model that we propose for, uh, for amylopectin. And that would make a, a very consistent description of all this level of uh, organization. So this is where we, the, almost of, we reach the end of this presentation. So the, now the arrow is almost complete and we start from the double helical structure, we go through growth ring, we have information about super helical structure, blocklet and so forth. And what remains to be solved are the formation of this layer line which appear whenever we degrade uh, starch granule by either amylose, uh, amylases or uh, acid. And uh, so this is the next coming uh, work which we are doing now uh, in terms of close packing. So there is a, a point which is essential also is that when you do solid state physics, you know that the ellipsoid, which are present here, offers the densest three-dimensional packing. And you remember, I'm always after this 1.5 uh, density figure. And now I'm tempting to propose the following models, which is on the right part of this slide, which would be a way to represent uh, the starch granule being constructing with this uh, idealized distribution of, of, uh, of uh, amylopectin, but that would also could explain maybe some of this uh, layer, which has been observed. In closing, I will show this one. So this is a starch granule, as we have been uh, going through. We start from the double helical structure. We have blocklets, and we go to, for the starch granule, 0.1 to 200 micrometers. And then I can com compare that to another double helical structure, where here we go from the double helical helix of DNA, which for a different type of organization is also leading to a chromosome, which is about uh, 1,200 nanometers. In both cases, we are starting from sugars. And in both cases, we are starting from double helical structure. So again, I'm tempting to, to, to conclude that nature has been uh, uh, using these uh, I mean sugars in both cases and also this double helical arrangement to maintain information and to maintain energy storage. But again, you know, this is a, philosoph it's a philosophical conclusion, which I may allow. In closing, I'd like to thank the many contributors who have been uh, involved in these many stories about, you know, uh, several, several years of research. And uh, with this, I'm very happy to conclude. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, first okay. question. Um, in view of the repeating helical structure, what is the minimal degree of polymerization in order for this helix to form and to form a crystal? Okay. Uh, you know, the, the, this degree of polymerization depends whether you are dealing with tuber starch or, or cereal starch. 
But at least, you know, we know we need at least 24. 24. Yeah, 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 24 units. But, you know, in the case of B starch, it's, uh, it's about, we know this is, this is longer. This is a longer DP. Okay. So I would say, you know, it takes about six contiguous residue to form this uh, 21 Armstrong repeat. And uh, we need slightly more to get, to get a, a more, more complete, a more stable helical structure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, this is, and this is what uh, that was used, you know, whenever uh, the, the, the single crystals of a, a type starch, you know, could be, could be grown. Okay, yes. Um, and also a following up question also from uh, Georges Anakin is about the, um, the golden spiral ellipsoids, uh, yes. which look uh, similar to ne needle-like crystallites described for inulins. Uh, which are polyfructose molecules. Yes. Um, so do you think that there is some kind of uh, similarity that could be, uh, or some comparison that could be with uh, inulin globule uh, formation? Oh, it could be, it could be. I mean, because, I mean, this sort of, uh, of, of um, spirals, you know, are not only restricted to, 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 to the pit of starch, you know, if you have, of course, if inulin can be also uh, arranged in crystalline domain whatsoever, and then uh, you, we can also envisage the orientation of this crystalline domain, you know, to form a super helical type of structure. So this is not a thing completely restricted to starch, I would say. And this is why we develop also this software, you know, that can be used for other type of exploration. Okay. Um, I have a question about the um, superhelixes and what is the size of the cavity within the superhelix? Well, you know, in, in, our, in our case, uh, we, we don't construct the superhelix as it was proposed to be constructed. In our spiral, you know, uh, ellipsoid, we have almost no, no inside cavity. And so this is why, you know, we can construct that by combining seven uh, uh, spirals integrating together. There is no steric conflict between the, 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 the crystals, but there is almost no, no, no cavity inside, which explains in a sense also the high density of this, of this construction. If there was a cavity, you know, uh, so the density will be, will be less. In our case, the construction which we have, you know, is about uh, 1.1 to 1.2, which is not the 1.3 that we discussed, but this indicates that we need this sort of arrangement to maintain the ice co this capacity. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Elisa Fada about whether you think there's a biological role for this intrinsic order in starch. Uh, I think this is a physical role. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, because you know, any, nowadays, you know, whenever we see something, we say, okay, there is an enzyme for that. Okay. I mean, this is glycobiology. But also, there is glycophysics. You know, when these things are constructing, they have to obey. You know, to physical law. And I think we have been forgetting a little bit too much of the glycophysics. Because also, as I said at the beginning, you know, we are dealing with starch component coming from different origin and so forth. So the enzyme also, of course, involved in the synthesis are different. There are some similarities that are different. The fact that we always go to the same capacity, to the same shape and so forth, you know, is a result of physics. The biology will introduce all the small results which are so important for the functionality of starch. Mm -hmm. And maybe but maybe not for the construction. And I think that follows uh, a next question by Fred Warren quite nicely about, do you think that the large differences in blocklet size could be in different botanical origins, could be predicted by differences in biosynthetic enzymes or other factors? Yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would say so, you know. So, so these different biosynthetic enzymes uh, could produce, you know, different type of, I would say, of crystalline arrangement, crystalline shape, and so forth. And from that, you know, will result a different type of construction, zero-tactic construction. Thank you. Um, a question from Andreas Bleno 
uh, about uh, what would you say about the cluster model and the backbone model? And do you think the cluster model is in accordance with your proposed blocklet structure? I mean, uh, I would say the, 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 the backbone model, you know, is more in accordance, you know, with, with, with what we have, yes. Yeah, okay. because I mean, we, have, we had this discussion with my friend, with there, Eric, for quite a long time, you know. And uh, coming from different side, I always, I always were said to Eric, can, I cannot build his Ukuri model, you know. And even I cannot build it throughout all the possibility. I mean, this means that the model may be not correct. So you say, you know, what we used to say when you do modeling, you know, all models are wrong, some are useful. So I hope that we are proposing a useful model. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe one last question uh, coming from Amin uh, Sadipur. Um, he was wondering if you have tried to average all scattering patterns from different directions, uh, because in SACS you can see a rotational average scattering pattern according yeah. to your proposed model. No, we have not, not done that, you know, but we have a single individual scattering pattern, and now it should be a question of doing this. Yeah. But that was, not, yeah, I understand, but you know, that was not the, the, the purpose of the, of the game. But I understand the possibility that we could do so. OK, uh, thank you. Can I have one more question, André, or do you want me to wrap up? One more? <laughs> OK. Um, so I guess coming back a little bit to the biology, another question from, from Georges uh, Van Aken about um, the reason for, I guess, such a tight starch structure, whether you think it's you know, to maintain a low osmotic storage and to prevent digestibility by microbes, I guess. Uh, you know, why, that, why did nature, I guess, design such a, a compact, um, almost resistant uh, structure for storing uh, glucose? Why? Yes. <laughs> okay, I mean, I mean, this is the result of the evolution. So evolution has been, <laughs> has been testing many, many types of possibility, and now we are facing with this one. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I, as, a, I, as a scientist, I, I, I rarely use why, you know, I would say, how come this has happened? Yeah, of course. Because why, 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 why may I mean something else? Yes, of course. And, you know, I think this uh, talk really clearly illustrates why we need to work together, physicists, biologists, um, you know, food nutritionists. And I hope that everybody today learned a little bit about, more about starch. Um, you know, often we think that starch is a simple molecule, a simple substrate, but no, in no, fact, no, no, no. it no, is no, not. No, 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 exactly. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. So but you, 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 you're right, Caroline, because, you know, as I said, we have a model now. We have to put this model, you know, in front of the biosynthetic pathway. Can, can we understand, you know, how we can reach this particular point of complexity? That's correct. And this yeah. is where you know we have to, 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 to collaborate more, even with, with people from both from the synthetic, so from the biosynthetic aspect. Certainly. Yes, of course. And I hope today I've been able to, 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 to bring a little bit of these different communities, you know, all together because this is what we need to do. Absolutely. Thank you very much for uh, coming to present your research today, and I hope that. You know, many of you, as you're eating uh, starch products yeah, today, yeah, you will yeah, be yeah. thinking about the beautiful molecules that you're eating. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank you very much, Serge. So good, good digestion, no? <laughs> <laughs> so, thank Excellent. you. So, uh, thanks, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, all of you. And, uh, Carolina, uh, excellent talk, good, good discussion. Uh, and I hope the other working groups are inviting um, equally good speakers uh, in the future. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, if you have any more questions, just type them in because um, uh, we will, or Serge will answer them uh, uh, separately afterwards uh, by, by email. And if you have any further questions, you can uh, uh, either email uh, myself or Carolina or Serge yes. directly. Okay, so I just okay. have uh, three or four more slides I want to share. So thanks, thanks again, Serge. Thank, thanks, uh, Carolina. So I hope you can see my screen. Um, so we were about 120 people, uh, which is a good number. So our next, um, our next webinar is on the 7th of uh, April. So back to the first Wednesday of each month, uh, two o'clock uh, Dublin time. Uh, we usually have two speakers. We have one confirmed. That's uh, uh, Annabelle from uh, the Quartum Institute 
in the UK, and she will present the semi-dynamic in, uh, InfoGest uh, model, so semi-dynamic digestion model. And then uh, the announcement that hopefully you are aware of it already, that we have a, a virtual food digestion conference in place of the physical in-person conference here in Cork. So the uh, conference will be on the 6th of May, it's a Thursday afternoon and uh, uh, Friday early morning. So we have six sessions uh, that are related to the working groups of the InfoGest. Um, and we have a seventh session on Friday early morning uh, coming live from Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we will have four, probably four talks uh, for each session. And the three of them are reserved for PhD students because uh, we felt that especially uh, the last 12 months, um, the PhD students, they need to present their results at international conference and we give them the opportunity to, uh, to present the results. However, you need to submit your abstract by the 25th of March, uh, 12 noon, that's Dublin time. Okay, okay. So uh, just uh, two more slides. InfoGest is an open network. If you want to be part of it, please send an email to uh, uh, Nathalie Lamar or Didier Dupont. Uh, we also, I also created the InfoGest group. So just go to uh, um, LinkedIn, type InfoGest and follow and you get uh, regular news. I'm also active on, on Twitter. So, and if you want to have a, um, if you have a um, um, paper related to food digestion, just add at InfoGest and at the moment over, over 600 people are following that. So anybody that uh, has subscribed to, uh, to the page will, uh, will receive the notification of your paper. So it's actually quite a useful tool to uh, publicize your, your work. We will also, we have recorded this webinar and we have put it on our YouTube channel. Uh, just type in vitro food digestion in YouTube. Uh, it will take two or, two or three days and we put it, put it up. So uh, uh, hope to see you again on the 7th of uh, April, two o'clock. Uh, two speakers again, uh, goodbye and Sloan, and of course, happy St. Patrick's Day. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.